Fostering Leadership is made possible by the generous donations of the Foster Foundation and Artie and Sue Burke. Hi, I'm Nick Perleros, your host for Fostering Leadership. Today we're at the headquarters of the Seattle Fire Department. The men and women firefighters of this department are all heroes. They go through a rigorous course of training to become firefighters for the city of Seattle. They train for the extreme. This week we're going to investigate what it means to lead in an extreme environment, looking at organizations where dangerous or life and death situations are an inherent part of their day-to-day -day operations. What are the lessons we can learn from organizations that are most prepared for persistent disruption, change, or conflict? Our stories of extreme leadership include the challenges of crab fishing in Alaska, the world of aviation safety, the dangers of firefighting, and the practice of leadership in the Army. Okay, let's get extreme. This week we asked folks, what are some critical factors for leadership in an extreme environment? That's got to be focus. Our leaders are expected to be extremely adaptable. Leadership in an extreme situation requires communication, communication, and communication. When the organization is under stress, I think, is the time you need to be most honest, most transparent, most authentic, most open. If you can't engender trust with the people you're working with, you're doomed. If the trust between people hasn't been built, crisis can tear you apart. And oftentimes what's needed is a major, major adjustment. First of all, make an accurate assessment of what's going on and, and develop a plan that's responsive to the situation. And the second thing is to get a team aligned around moving the entity, the organization, to where it needs to go. The Bering Sea, stormy weather, and fishing for king crab sounds like an accurate description of an extreme work environment. But for one of our own Foster MBA graduates, this extreme environment has been home for the perfect job and for the challenges of extreme leadership. Meet Captain Dan Matson, managing partner of three fishing boats. Years ago, I started law school, discovered I did not want to be a lawyer. That's what prompted me to become a fisherman. <laughs> so I uh, called up a friend of mine who was working in Alaska, and he secured me a position on a boat. And the rest is history. I quickly realized fishing was very challenging. I also quickly realized that uh, being on deck on a crab boat was incredibly demanding. To have a well-trained crew, the captain had to be, have a plan, the engineering on the boat had to be uh, perfect because uh, the, the costs of failure or breakdown were uh, very extreme. Although I'd worked hard to go through college and uh, was no stranger to hard work, uh, working on deck of a crab boat is, is just amazing difficult and, and but working with five four or five other guys on the deck on a well run deck is also an amazing experience it's like a choreography every person has their uh, job and every person's job depends upon everybody else performing their job and when it works it's really magical uh, captain dan action figures when they get them oh. Since 1983, I've been a licensed Coast Guard merchant mariner, and that was the ticket to get up in the wheelhouse. Once I became the mate, then I could be uh, I'd spend more time upstairs rather than downstairs. And I gradually uh, honed my craft and uh, got opportunities to run, like this boat, for a season. At sea, it's all about preparedness. You have to prepare both for things going well you have to also be prepared for when it doesn't go. What are you going to do if you lose the crane? What are you going to do if that winch blows a seal? What about if you lose a hydraulic hose on the crab block with three hours left in the season and 30 pots to haul? How are you going to deal with that? So you have to envision all possibilities. You have to wonder uh, and, and think through how you're going to deal with uh, things that can go wrong. The other thing is picking the right people. You can solve a lot of problems if you have a good cook on a boat, You've got a good engineer, and you've got somebody who's owning the back deck here who's kind of your deck boss. So that's the uh, key to, to running things uh, on the vessel. From uh, the financial side, it's, it's fairly easy to mitigate the risks with insurance. What's more devastating, of course, or if, if somebody's severely injured, is to figure out why it happened and to uh, deal with the aftermath. I mean, people's lives are at stake out here. It's a very dangerous occupation. It was called the deadliest catch because crab fishing 
was, for a time, the most deadly uh, fishery in America. It's actually not now. <laughs> it's, it's much safer. You can't operate at this level if you're out in a big storm in the Bering Sea without being uh, tremendously focused on what you're doing. Last day of the trip. It is a very extreme way to make a living. Overall, doing what I've done has been the right path for me. It, it's hard to see sometimes when you're when you're in the middle of it just how uh, how much of a gift that that is this has been. All in all, it's been a darn good trip. Recent history has shown what can happen when response to a natural disaster is fraught with a lack of coordination and a dearth of interagency communication. Hurricane Katrina provides a vivid reminder, as does the more recent BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Despite those glaring examples of how not to respond, a master plan is in place for virtually every agency, local, regional, and national, on how to work together in disaster response. It's called the Incident Command System, or ICS. The fall of 1970 found California ablaze in wildfires. Unrelenting Santa Ana winds flamed infernos from Oakland south to the Mexican border, some 400 miles. The Golden State was accustomed to wildfires, but had never seen anything like this. Firefighting resources were stretched to the breaking point. In one San Diego County fire alone, more than 70 different agencies responded with equipment and personnel. But in fire after fire, location after location, property and lives were lost due to poor coordination of resources. Arguments flared along with the flames, as battles were waged over who was in command, who had jurisdiction, and who was to give orders, and who was supposed to follow them. Over the course of 13 days, 16 people died and scores were injured, 700 structures were destroyed, and over a half million acres burned. Out of the ashes of those devastating fires, the incident command system arose. ICS quickly gained wide acceptance as a systematic model for command, control, and coordination of resources and personnel at scenes of emergency. ICS typically uses a first on-scene structure in determining command. The first responder is in charge until the superior ranking responder is present or an incident commander is assigned. The key components of ICS are unity of command, each individual reports to only one supervisor. Common terminology, essential to team cohesion and communication. Management by objective, incidents are managed by aiming at specific objectives. Flexible and modular, incident structure can expand and contract as needed. Span of control, no individual span of management control extends beyond seven individuals, with five being ideal. Today, ICS use goes well beyond emergency services. Many businesses use it to ensure clear communication, accountability, and efficient use of resources. The California fires of 1970 brought significant loss of life and property, but they spawned the incident command system, which has since saved countless lives and assets. Stay tuned for more of Fostering Leadership. Our next story takes us deeper into the world of the Incident Command System. Fire Marshal Chief Bud Backer of Eastside Fire and Rescue really makes the Incident Command System come alive for us as we take a closer look at extreme leadership. Some people will refer to us as adrenaline junkies because everybody likes, they like the excitement. You know, who else goes to a burning building? Being a leader in the fire service, you have to be flexible because you've got the everyday routines that call for kind of a business environment type leadership. But then when we have our incidents that we have to deal with, our emergency scenes, it takes a little stronger personality and leadership style. But with the systems that we use, the incident command system, 
really lays things out for us in how we're going to plan and organize how we're going to take care of the event. Fire attack on floor three with search. The logo on the front of your helmet matches what's on top of this passport. So as Engine 85 arrives, if I assign them to a pre-existing group or division, they will take the entire passport as it is to that person and give it to that person supervising. But if I take that lieutenant and I need him to do something, I might make him my safety officer and put his name up there so now I know he's the safety officer. And this has done wonders for us. It cuts down on freelancing. You know, you can't have somebody just out there doing something on their own without the system knowing what's going on. The incident command system is the structure that we operate in at all of our incidents, and it allows us at an incident scene to actually delegate out responsibility. And through that delegation, you know, the people, your trained subordinates are able to get things done and make them happen without the incident commander having to have his hands in everything. The incident commander now is more able to be situationally aware of what's going on in the overall incident. And then we allow the people who are assigned the positions below that in order to make the tactical decisions, the actual, how do I do that? So when I say, we're gonna stop the fire here, I don't tell them how we're gonna do it. The people in those positions go figure that out because I'm busy managing the overall, the overall incident. The incident command system is very empowering because everybody has their role in a large incident, we will actually, uh, like a, a natural disaster type thing that may last several days, we'll actually start every day out with a briefing where we explain to everybody, here are the expectations of the day and who is assigned to what areas of the incident and what their goals are. So everybody knows that, and they know that within the structure itself, what level of decisions they can make and what is expected of them. Confirm with your crews that they understand that you're Division A. I think the most critical factor is the communication skills because if you can communicate calmly and clearly, one, they're going to hear what the directions are that, are that are being given so they can accomplish the goals and objectives of the incident. Secondly, maintaining that calm demeanor while you're on the radio and giving direction is huge. People feed off your energy. If you're calm, they're going to remain calm. Safety is, our, is one of our first thoughts. It's always risk a lot to save a lot, risk nothing to save nothing. Translated, that means if there are people in the building that's on fire, go in there and do your best to get them out. On this week's segment of The Desk, Richard Tate of Boom Boom Brands and Phyllis Campbell of J.P. Morgan Chase share their personal experiences and views on the topic, extreme leadership. Welcome to this segment of The Desk. Today we're calling it Extreme Leadership. So Richard, you have some examples you can give us. Um, I've got uh, one in particular that sticks out. Uh, okay. Cranium, uh, we'd won Game of the Year multiple times mm, and never had a product recall. Okay. And in our ninth year of existence, we unfortunately were in a situation uh, where we had uh, l found some lead in paint on a die. Wow. That's a now, this is one. a culture of, that has been rallying around the quality of our products, and all sure. of a sudden we have to invert it and mm. go into almost a bunker mode mm. dealing with that. So from a leadership perspective, the important steps were first was to quantify this, the scale of the problem. Secondarily was to isolate where the problem was occurring. And then we moved into the mode of how do we respond. Right. We had to communicate externally and internally and with partners, the retail partners. And so we just went into this very different mode of operation. Were you in denial at all during that period of, of time? Course. Yeah, of course. I mean, course. at the very beginning, you know, we never yeah. had anything like that happen. Sure. In nine years of yeah. operation, yeah, and then yeah. all of a sudden we were dealing with mm -hmm. a different situation. Mm -hmm. What about you? Well, I, I don't have a, that kind of maybe a crisis that uh, was so dramatic uh, as an example, but uh, certainly from a situation of going through mergers and acquisitions, you see, uh, again, lots of change, lots of unexpected things going. I think the thing that's been probably the best practice out of all of these is, is setting up what we would call a situation room through a very complex yeah. process, yep. right? I mean, to your point, you learn things, I think you iterate and you get better at these kinds of things. I don't think you can always anticipate the, the, the crisis that you talked about. But I do think what you can do is, with our situation room, we set up pretty much a business where we go through a process not just to be operational conversions, but thinking about people conversions, training, everything from systems to signs to every detail that we can anticipate. And really the situation room is there 24-7. 
um, you know, uh, occupies two floors of a building. We really go through the whole thing. So it's kind of similar where we moved into a mode in yeah. kind of a bunker mode and you would have the situation, situation be, room. be right. consistent across yeah, both of those Yeah, I think that might be a similarity. You know, one other interesting observation I have is about the role of a leader during an extreme leadership situation. I mean, that, that is the role of the leader, in fact, I think, is the leader has to stay calm, centered, and, and really, I think, in a sense, just um, help the organization face the brutal facts. I would agree. And one of my past lives working at Microsoft, um, then I saw that in an extreme case where mm -hmm. I think the book that hasn't been written about Microsoft is without competition, the, the culture doesn't gets a little flaccid. They mm -hmm. need the competition to mm -hmm. get that kind of response. And with Netscape at the dawn of the internet and the browser mm -hmm. wars, then example. Bill wrote a great memo that galvanized the organization and called us to step forward mm -hmm. and deal with that competitive situation. Mm -hmm. So I think that there, again, it's communication, but the role sure. of the leader, the leader is certainly to keep a firm hand on the tiller and also to ask the culture to respond in a way that they, ha they weren't responding at that, mm -hmm. at that point of time. It's a great example. So I think communication, again, is a key mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. in terms of extreme leadership. Mm -hmm. um, the bunker mentality and focus on details and the scope of the problem mm -hmm. and isolating the different variables, I think, is also a key learning. I Any others too. you would add? Well, and I would just add uh, maybe thinking about a virtual situation room. It doesn't have to be a real, real necessarily real time, but a virtual situation room where you've really pre-anticipated as much as you can, done some pre-planning, and really gone through the mental exercise Planning of how it would key. actually work. And that's it from the desk. Thanks for joining us. On this week's Q&A, we had the chance to meet with John Nance, a veteran airline pilot and aviation analyst. Over the years, John has focused his attention on the airline industry, and more recently, healthcare, organizations that often have the need for extreme leadership skills. How can a leader best manage through the magnitude of potential catastrophe? The most important element is for people not to go shooting from the hip without information. And a good leader is one who has already created lines of communication that he or she can trust because that's what you're going to need, communication from all aspects long before you make a decision or start firing off decisions that are probably going to be flawed if they're not based on the reality of what's happened. What specifically can a leader do to help create that sort of environment so that when those moments arise, that communication is already in place? One of the problems of leadership is that people will smile at you and tell you things that they want you to hear. A friend of mine made general and another general pinned a star on him and said, congratulations, general, no one will ever tell you the truth again. This is the agony of leadership. But the fact is that if you're good, over time, what you're doing is building those channels all the way down to the front lines. And you spend enough time doing this that you've got a good picture of what's going on. That way you're building trust, and that trust will pay incredible benefits and dividends when something gets to threatening the company or the organization. How does a leader prepare for the never events? You take a look at aviation. One of the reasons that we've been able to go five years between 2001 and 2006 with zero passenger devs in the United States, which is incredible, about 6,800 uh, opportunities per day for a, a major mistake, the way we've been able to do that is by making sure that we understand all the things that could possibly happen. I mean, down to very, very small possibilities and probabilities and preparing for all of those. And this is very important. This is why Three Mile Island occurred and why we almost lost the nuclear power generation industry as an industry was because there was total chaos in that control room. There were no clear lines of authorities and, more importantly, they had not planned for all the things that could occur. How does a leader pick up themselves and their organization after an extreme event? Number one is to acknowledge the pain, acknowledge on a human basis, on always a human basis, the people that you've got who are in trauma and why the organization is where it is and where you're going, total honesty. Secondly is kind of accident incident investigation. That's to lay everything out on the table factually, not who's wrong, but what's wrong. Figure out all that happened and then put a plan together in complete conjunction with your people to make sure this never happens again. If it's survivable, it's only going to be survivable if everybody is engaged and they know they cannot trust the honesty of the leader. What are the success stories of this new approach? Th there was no miracle of the Hudson. 
There really wasn't. I mean, now, if you want to argue with me that it was a miracle that it was daytime and the water was calm, I'll agree with you. But there was no miracle that they survived the landing because that was what we have done is reduce the variables and procedures in order to unload the cognitive capabilities of the people who we have in those cockpits in that particular case. So you've got uh, Sullenberger in the left seat and you've got Jeff Skiles, the co-pilot in the right seat. They had about 15 seconds to make a decision to land in the water or to go for a runway, which would have killed them if they tried to go over there. They didn't have enough speed, enough hours altitude. But that decision would have been completely different. They would have gone for the runway if we hadn't learned to minimize variables by putting specific procedures in place. That leaves the cognitive capabilities exactly where they should be. There is a role for the cognitive brilliance of an education and a, 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 a continuum of experience in any profession. But what you don't want to do is waste that by reinventing wheels. And unfortunately, the way we practice in some industries, medicine most notably, everything is discretionary. That's not the way it ought to be. Stay tuned for more of Fostering Leadership. Next up, Pay It Forward brings us another mentorship story from the Foster School of Business. When Foster MBA candidate Bo Height had to choose his second year mentor, his eye was caught by Susan Heyman's background. Heyman, the Vice President of Environmental and Governmental Affairs for FOSS Maritime, has served in the Navy and is now in the Naval Reserves, just like Height. I've been very surprised at, that yeah. I've liked jobs that I didn't think I was going to like. But, you know, my boss or somebody said, oh, you know, you really should try this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's like, no, you really should. I could tell just by reading Susan's background and uh, where she come from that I could connect with her a lot easily than, than someone who has maybe spent most of their career in, in the finance industry. Our naval careers and how you manage that with, with work is an interesting aspect that I've had to deal with and I, I know Bo's dealing with now as well. When you start a new job, how long does it take you before you're like comfortable with the role, the position, the people? The way I do that is to really delve into the details of how everybody who worked for me was doing their job and how things got done. I think what I've taken away from it is even though we're new, freshly minted students coming out of the MBA program and you go into a new organization, you still have the influence and the capability to maybe drive the business in a new direction or just ask the questions that need to be asked. Yeah, I love my job. And, so you're enjoying the work then? Yeah, and we're, the company's doing really well, they're growing. I think for me, I can kind of look backwards and say, okay, I wish I'd done that or not done this, or this is maybe how you handle that. And I, I think that that's an important aspect of the, the mentor-mentee -men relationship is just sort of you know, trying to impart those things and then allowing them to ask really good questions because they really made me and their questions think about choices I made. As kind of a new graduate, uh, it's part of your job and, you know, kind of part of your kind of ethos should be to ask the questions of, you know, why? Why are we doing things the way that they're doing them? And not to be afraid at the same time to ask those questions. Are you still doing reserves? I am. I am too. <laughs> Our final story from the field takes us to West Point and the Army Center of Excellence for the Professional Military Ethic. What better place to learn about extreme leadership? The director of this center, Colonel Sean T. Hanna, has been a part of many extreme events during his military career. From Desert Storm to quelling riots in Los Angeles, from service in Cuba and Panama to the events of 9-11 at the Pentagon. And leadership in extreme contexts is a major area of study for Colonel Hanna. In my career, I've been faced with at least a dozen extreme events, and almost every single one of them, I had no idea of the, the, the page that would be turned and what would come next. There's a major difference between an extreme context and an extreme event. Even combat, for example, is an extreme context, but it is a really a sequence of extreme events that will occur. When soldiers are back in a garrison or what we call a forward operating base, or a combat outpost environment, for example. They're, they're eating meals, they may be playing video games, talking to their, their loved ones back at home, but then they roll outside the gate and they have the opportunity of, of perhaps uh, conducting various extreme events. 
that will happen with your actual combat operations. During the preparation phase, for instance, before an extreme event, a leader needs to overcome complacency, that human natural reaction to, to be complacent and to think, hey, it can't happen here. So a leader has to establish vigilance. They have to identify the weaknesses of their organization. Adaptive organizations that are effective in extreme contexts are always planning for the possible contingencies of what may come in the future. To include what we call in the Army war game drills, where we, we continuously look at our plans, and then also building trust across all levels of the organization and building psychological resources such as confidence, hope, resiliency are, are major factors that a leader needs to accomplish during the preparation phase. As an organization transitions, however, into an extreme event, there's different human needs on the line. People are now under threat, they're under fear. A leader needs to step forward and focus on the core values of the organization. They've got to be careful about things like information overload. And sometimes it's important for a leader to actually calm people down and get them back centered again and control their energy. Leaders, of course, are also managers, and they've got to manage flexible resourcing during times of crisis and make sure that the right resources are getting to the right place at the right time. And then finally, after an extreme event, it's absolutely critical that, that the leaders help the organization heal and recover and reorganize. And this, this requires things like reestablishing faith, reestablishing a sense of meaning in the organization, and also restoring systems. And one of the most important things after an extreme event is that the leader helps the organization to learn. So they don't just pick up and move on, that they stop and they learn from the last event so that they can prepare for the next one. And finally, leaders, of course, has to establish vigilance again, once again, getting ready for the next extreme event. Well, combat and, and any other type of extreme event is what we would call a high performance context. It's, it's a type of context that demands high performance because anything less is, is failure. And it's, it's even a moral imperative that we operate at the highest possible performance. If we don't, people get killed, people get injured. People rely on each other for their very lives and for their, their futures. And so trust is what makes the, the entire system go around. Time now for our quiz. Let's find out what you've learned and what you think you know. Effective leadership in extreme events characterized by high levels of uncertainty and unpredictability generally requires that the leader develop a suitable approach to the situation on the fly. True or false? Inspirational leadership is the most effective style of leadership for extreme events. True or false? The key learning that organization members must do to improve their effectiveness occurs after an extreme event is over. True or false? Go to our website, take our quiz, and see how you do. Each week we'll have a new quiz on leadership based on the theme of our show. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Next week, we'll look at how some businesses are able to apply some extreme lessons in their pursuit of successful leadership practices. Our stories cover a variety of businesses, from a classic and delicious Seattle restaurant icon to a relatively new professional sports organization that is making headlines, from an architectural concrete company that is paving its way as a national player to a Pacific Northwest airline ranked highest in customer satisfaction three years in a row. All these stories and more when we see you next week for Fostering Leadership. Fostering Leadership was made possible by the generous donations of the Foster Foundation and Artie and Sue Burke. To find out more about Fostering Leadership, go to our website, uwtv.org slash fosteringleadership.